Um, hope you enjoyed those scones at morning tea. I know I did. Very nice. Good reason to come back to Binya next time, I think. Um, so our next speaker for this morning is um, Carol Harris, and her topic is mixed annual fodder crops for grazing animal production. Carol is a research scientist with New South Wales DPI based at Glen Innes in the northern tablelands of New South Wales. Carol has over 30 years experience conducting field-based pasture research in temperate and tropical pasture species evaluation, agronomy, optimising grass legume pasture mixes to improve productivity and sustainability, soil fer fertility management and invasive grass weed management. Uh, so, and Carol is a leader of the MLA-funded project called uh, the Mixed Annual Fodder Crops for Grazing Animal Production. And we'll let uh, Carol tell us all about that. Uh, thanks, Jeff, and thanks to Riverino LLS for giving me the opportunity to come and talk somewhere completely out of my normal environment. So um, thanks for that opportunity. Um, as uh, Jeff said, I'm talking about a project called the Mixed Annual Fodder Crop Project for Grazing Livestock Production. Um, it's funded by MLA and it's sort of halfway through its process. And I guess one of the things we're trying to do is reduce the noise that Richard referred to around mixtures and uh, get a bit more scientific uh, input into some of uh, the, the things that we need to know more about in this space. So today I'm just going to talk a little bit about the what, the why, and the how of mixed annual fodder crops. Um, talk a little bit about our project and some of the preliminary results that we're getting, and maybe some, some of the learnings to date more around practical considerations rather than um, sort of scientific data. Um, so as Richard said, a mixture is just simply a combination of different plants sewn together. In this case, we're looking to try and combine some plants of different functional types. So quite often, these mixes are going to be made up of a cereal, a brassica, a legume, and a grass. So fairly simple mixes. You might have one or two varieties within that mix, but basically, that's the, the components of the mix. And you'd be probably using them to address a specific feed gap, so an autumn-winter autumn, feed gap. So I'm really talking about uh, these mixes in a winter annual fodder context, but there's also, um, we've also done a little bit of work on summer mixes as well, so summer cropping mixes as well. So there's sort of um, using for different feed gaps, but probably you're going to grow it to address a feed gap. But then one of the other reasons would be to be provide that diverse and balanced source of nutrition for livestock. So Richard referred to the metabolic disorders that sometimes a single species can cause. So by using a mix, you might be able to give a more um, even profile of nutrition and, and reduce the chances of some of those um, metabolic disorders. It's to complement your other forage sources. So it's to complement if you've got perennial pastures with an annual, past, of annual legume base, uh, if you're using dual purpose crops, these mixes can fit into that systems approach and complement what you, you're currently doing. And it's to give some resilience to climate variability, so to give you a bit of insurance to cover some of the niches that we're going to have with the different climate variability that we're encompassing. Um, so this is just a little repeat of some of the things we just said, but it's to give you that extended grazing period. So by putting a mix in, you might be able to get earlier feed and then grow later into the growing season, do some diverse growth patterns. Uh, potentially increase biomass or increase production. Um, I should say all of these points are reported benefits, and I'll get onto that a little bit more. But a more balanced nutritional profile, reduced metabolic issues, high quality forages can support increased animal intake and increased animal live weight gain. There's the soil health parameters. So we've talked a little, or Richard talked about the night nitrogen fixation by legumes. If so you've got a legging component in these pastures, there's a potential benefit to the next crop or the next pasture that you're putting in. Uh, increased organic matter, there's some reports around increased water infiltration, uh, particularly if you're using uh, something like a tillage radish, that you're getting 
um, the, the, tiller, the, the tillage radish growing down and opening up the soil a bit. Uh, and then being given an ability to do some um, specific weed control at crop termination. So um, because you're terminating that crop, you know you're terminating it, you can time that and you can time that to do particular weed control um, uh, cleanups if you need to. Um, so the challenge is some of these mixed annual fodder crops. A lot of the information we have in Australia is based on farmer experience or, you know, non-sort of scientific reported studies or a lot of overseas studies that, as Richard pointed out, are not our environment, not our production systems and often not with that emphasis on um, animal health issues. So there's very little data and validation and particularly looking at the economics associated with mixed annual fodder crops in Australia. Um, it's not to say there's a, there's a lot of people doing it, but we just don't have some sort of rigour around the data that's coming out of some of those um, uh, situations. There's also some problems around logistics at sowing. So obviously if we're sowing a mix, you've got different seed sizes. And if you don't have um, the proper machinery, so if you don't have um, multiple seed boxes, sometimes sowing uh, those different mixes to get the sort of compromised, optimised sowing depth can be is an issue. There's few options for in-crop weed management. So because you're having uh, brassicas and legumes in there, there's going to be a lower number of chemicals that you can use. So you really need to get your weed management right going into that crop and then coming out of that crop. But during the time that you're growing, there's little, little opportunity for weed control. And even though um, we might be reducing some of the metabolic issues, there's also potential for increased animal health issues with you know, high uh, legume content, particularly if you're using some of the clover species. Uh, brassicas, there's a potential for nitrate poisoning if uh, you're not managing properly. So there's a, a need for a higher range of management around that to reduce any animal health issues. But because there's so little data on this in Australia, this project that um, I'm involved with, we're trying to um, get a bit more rigour in there and understand how the different um, components that we just talked about and the challenges might work. And we're doing this through a series of um, three sort of phases. Uh, initially, we did a range of agronomy experiments, which were a smaller plot, uh, looking at a range of different mixes compared to uh, a single species control, and then looking at what they did um, at three different environments over three different years. So we've got a, a good data set now of, of what's happening in terms of mixes. Um, and whether there's some benefits. We looked at some other sort of agronomic issues around time to sowing and a little bit around soil depth as well. Then we scaled up into bigger plot sizes, so around um, a third of a hectare, a hectare plots, uh, looking at the grazing uh, of these mixed annual fodder crops um, with lambs, both at Wagga and Gleninus, and having a look at not only the fodder production, but also the animal uh, live weight gains, uh, mineral composition of their blood, rumen um, fluids, and also urine samples. So we're having a look at how, how they're impacting on the animal. And then one, after we've, we've also scaled up again to a more commercial scale application at six farms across the state, looking at how these mixed annual fodder crops can actually be used in a farm system. So this is a messy slide, sorry, but it's just to show you from one of the agronomy experiments in 2022, so it's just a snapshot of one of the experiments, what the dry matter production looked like over five months uh, at Urangili in 2022. Um, the thing to look for is look like just the height of the curve. So that is the total production at each of those harvest dates. So you can see it was quite low initially. And then sort of by the third to fourth harvest date, it started to pick up. And we had peak sort of in that fifth harvest uh, month, which was around October. The, the blue, the dark blue, is brassica, so you can see that it was quite active in the mixes where it was um, present, 
quite early, so uh, it was showing good production quite early. Uh, the grey is the legume, and you can see that it was a significant component of a majority of the mixes that it was in. The sort of orangey colour was the cereal, um, and the yellow colour is the weeds. And so we've got on that graph, which you probably can't see very well, but we've got a range of different treatments uh, going from pure cereal, pure legume, pure brassica, right through to having them combined in a mix, which is the one right smack bang in the middle. Um, and you can see that it had the, the highest production. Um, so overall in that experiment, the, the mixes were producing more biomass, at, but the contribution of each species was different at every, every harvest. If we look at the quality of those treatments, um, it's once again a busy graph, but just to show you that there were some variations in quality, particularly early on, um, where we had a brassica, there was higher metabolizable energy in comparison to the cereal only mix. So not only was there a bit more biomass at that time, we were actually getting higher quality forage. Um, the protein on the other side, you can see as the crop matures, regardless of what the mixture was, that there was a decline in crude protein over time as the harvest went along. But um, where there was legume in the mix, which is the bottom left-hand uh, quadrant on your graph, you can see that there was much higher protein in those legume mixes, and particularly where you had more legume in the mix, there was a higher crude protein. So just some interesting little differences there. It may not be a consistent uh, change in quality across the growing season, but at various times there might be some differences that might lift animal production. This is another messy um, one. So this is where we're using the drought feed calculator, using the information from that trial in terms of the yield and the quality, and trying to make some predictions about what the animal production could be based uh, when we're comparing a pure brassica sward to a brassica cereal legume sward. And on the first harvest date, the actual brass, pure brassica was higher, in both in terms of intake and live weight gain. August data is missing because the biomass was just too low to make a prediction on animal performance. Uh, and then, but from the September harvest, the first, uh, first September harvest, we can see that the mix is actually higher in terms of predicted intake and predicted life weight gain. So this is just to give an idea of potentially what, what animal performance might be like. Moving to the actual, an actual grazing experiment, um, which is the one in Wagga last year. We had four treatments, um, brassica, brassica and cereal, brassica, cereal and legume, and brassica legume mixes. Um, and they were grazed by lambs um, for 35 days and at certain days, so day zero, so when the lambs went onto the plots, then 21 days and day 35. There was um, fodder assessments done, so the same uh, features that we did before, biomass and, and quality. But we also did arrange those animal measurements that I mentioned before, so weigh the lambs, do the bloods, do the urine, et cetera, et cetera, to try and understand what was happening in both the biomass and the animal measurements. There's uh, the treatments there. Uh, you can see... The pure um, brassica is just the, the pure blue graph at the top. And then we have the various mixes. So you can see that overall the mixes had higher biomass than the brassica only, except for maybe the brassica legume mix. There was not much difference in those two at, at various times. Moving on to the animals, you can see that there on day 21, there was a significant difference between average live weight gain with, the, um, with some of the animals, so the female animals, there was a difference. The mixes were higher. And with the males, it was not quite so conclusive. And then day 35, it was also a little bit inconclusive, but there was some trending to su suggest that the mixes were better. Although by that time, the brassica crop, had, um, yeah, the canola crop had pretty well failed, so the, in the control plots only. So mixed, mixed results, but interesting trends. We have got the mineral um, 
minerals data, but uh, we're still sort of analysing some of the components of that to, to understand. But they're looking like that the mixes um, were all adequate in calcium. So um, there's just a few other things they've got to test before that. Um, this is just the on-farm validation sites, um, and this is just a bit of a summary of where they are. So, Cadell, Quandiello, and Pleasant Hills, uh, and there's a range of different mixes. Those mixes were determined by the producers that were involved with the project uh, in comparing to wheat in all cases. Uh, a few different breeds of um, lam uh, lambs there, and different numbers depending on the stocking rate and the paddock size. Uh, all grazed for somewhere around that 46 to 51 days or 52 days. Uh, and there was some interesting results coming from each site. So at the Kidal site, we were able to do two grazings, had run two flocks of lambs. Um, and the biomass tended to be higher in the mixes at each assessment. And, but the, the um, live weight gains were fairly similar between the two treatments. Um, but the flock in the second lot of sheep um, tended to have higher carcass weight in the, from the mixed paddocks. Um, in the Quandiella site, we had higher average daily gains. Um, with the figures are there, 230 compared to 287 grams per day across the whole of that grazing period. Um, Pleasant Hills, we had less clear results. There was definitely higher biomass in the control side, the wheat side, but that was a slightly different lower stocking rate, so it was a bit hard to make a, a fair comparison there. But overall, there were still similar live weight gains coming from both. So um, with, there was much higher quality in terms of crude protein in the mix. So some so interesting results there. Two of those sites, Cadell and Quandiella, are going again this year, and we're doing a similar thing, but on a different paddock. Um, just some things that we've sort of picked up and I'll try and go through them fairly quickly. There was the one thing that we've learned is that to consider the time of the feed gap that you want to fill. So knowing when you want to have that food fodder on hand um, will determine how you pick your timing of sowing and also the species and varieties of, that you might want to use. Really important to go for things that are adapted to your environment and suited to the climate, soil, and your capacity for utilisation. So um, what we found at the Cadell site was they underestimated how much fodder they were going to have and how many lambs they would need. So that's why we did two flocks of lambs, because they still had a bulk of feed that they needed to utilise. Um, if you want to put a brassica or a canola in there, that's going to give you probably early feed and give a bit of time for the legume to um, kick off and, and make production. Uh, if you're looking to extend your grazing season well into the late spring, then you might need to pick a few um, varieties that have got later maturity, so something like in your legume component, something like an arrow leaf clover, or, or in our environment, we go for a later maturing ryegrass. So um, need to think about what that mix is, and I think it also goes back to the point Richard made, make it keep the mix as simple and as adapted to your environment as possible. Um, Seasonal conditions are going to have an impact on what actually happens and what species becomes dominant. So if you have a really wet year, something might become more dominant than in a really dry year. Um, so you need to sort of be prepared for that. Um, sowing, as we've talked about before, if you can sow it as early as possible in your window, the better. Uh, and then there's a few other points there that we've kind of covered anyway. Just one last point is just it's a very large project with uh, various sites around the country. Um, so just an acknowledgement to all the DPI researchers, both um, agronomists and livestock officers that work on the project and the technical staff. There's too many to name, sorry. Um, but most importantly, the advisors and producers that provide valuable insights uh, through our producer reference group and also who host sites around the state as well. Thank you. Thanks, Carol. And uh, Carol will be back up for the Q&A session after lunch.